Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. Back in February 2018, I spent most of a couple of days at the Julian Farm in Medford, Wisconsin, where Jason and Katrina Julian operate a small, diversified family farm centered around milking their Flecva and Jersey dairy cows. The farm is truly a family affair with each of the three sons, Aaron, Joshua, and Michael, sharing in the daily chores as well as Jason's mother, Kathy, who is also busy helping both in and outside on the farm. Today we're going to the woods with Jason and five of his American Brabant horses. We caught up with him as he harnessed those horses around 6 a.m. in preparation to loading them in the trailer to be transported to the woods a few miles away. One of those five horses is his new stallion, Conan, that the Julians bought about five months earlier to replace their beloved stallion, Billings, that viewers might remember from a Rural Heritage episode a few years ago when Jason was teaching Billings to drive over a two-day period. When the stallion Conan arrived at the Julian farm last fall, he had virtually no training, and today he will be working in the woods with one of the Julian's mares as a teammate. Well, last July, we come up here as the hottest two days of the summer. We don't get a lot of hot days here in northern Wisconsin. And it just happened to be that we were ready to pour concrete in our new barn. And we formed concrete forms up all morning, and we came up here at noon, and we watered all the horses, Billings, was standing in a stall here and a couple other horses that we had used, I don't know what, I'd cultivated corn early that morning or something. And uh, we're keeping them in here in the shade out of the flies. We watered all the horses at noon. We went in for dinner and uh, the cement was coming right after dinner. We poured like 45 yards, four and a half cement truckloads of cement that afternoon. We come in here at 5.30, already late for evening milking, exhausted from cement. Here lays my blue roan four and a half year old stud in the stall, all laid out, looked like death. And I thought maybe he got tangled or what the heck happened. This is Billings. This is Billings. And uh, so we called the vet, called, did everything we could. You know, he'd act like he was drinking water. When he'd pee, he peed like black coffee, which is already a kidney problem sign. And we fought with the vet for three days. Ended up putting Billings down over big boy. Three days later, an old guy, not old, older than me, not on Facebook, didn't know anything about it, calls me from Washington State and says, Jason, I've known this fellow for a while. I said, Jason, I'm selling my land down by the river and I'm downsizing selling my horses, selling some horses. You want to buy my stud? He didn't know Billings died. I mean, how weird is that? And I said, no. I mean, I was just angry. I don't know if I'll ever own another stud. I don't know what I want to do. I don't even know if I'm staying in Robbins. I was angry. That was my second stud I'd lost in four or five years. We work out a deal oh, um, to buy his stud, who we didn't know much about, except I'd seen one photograph, he looked good, short back, compact, chunky horse, 16 hands. I'd say at that point he was probably 1850. He was a little on the chubby side, out on that mountain grass. And they had told me, you know, he's not broke, he's eight years old, so I already knew I was getting into a challenge. But they said, oh, he's real tame, you know, we can catch him. Oh. There's certain lines with horse people that you should just know. Like he's a big pet, stuff like that. Well, anyways, we get there and I liked him. And he has really good papers, a lot of farceur in his lines. And then the imports, he's 50% European. And uh, the guy's got a halter on him and got him into a smaller lot off of the big pasture that he ran in for eight years. But I knew when I watched the body language between the owner and the horse who were in for it. 
So we spent two and a half hours on the side of that mountain trying to get Conan into my trailer. And uh, basically he learned a lot in that first two and a half hours because I think that was the first time in his life that he didn't get his way. He didn't get away and he didn't get his way. And he pitched temper tantrums and he pitched himself on the ground. And uh, he just, I wasn't giving in. He couldn't get away from me. He was going on that trailer and I had to get off that mountain before dark. I wanted off that mountain before dark. So two and a half hours later, we have Conan um, on the trailer and we're headed for home. And uh, 35 hours of driving later, we're home with our eight-year-old horse that has absolutely no mare manners, doesn't know anything. You can barely lead him to water. I mean, he is like leading a tornado. But anyways, now we're five months later and he ain't all the way there. He's nowhere near my horses. You know, it's hard to take an eight-year-old horse and turn him into one that you've had your whole life instantly. But you can see we've come a long ways in five months. Yeah. Uh, we're here four and a half miles north of my farm. Um, it's an 80 acre parcel. It's owned by a, re a retired um, lady that, well, they built this beautiful log cabin and then a year or so later, her husband passed. And she, she and her husband did not like any of the logging in the area that was around them. So they have 80 acres here that hadn't been logged in like 55 or 60 years. So it's an incredibly incredibly tight woods. Um, a lot of single horse getting. Today we used a log arch and a team because we were in bigger wood and a little more open spot in the woods and we're, we're breaking this Conan horse. But uh, the woods desperately needed cutting. It needed some light to get to the floor because she's got saplings coming, but you can cut some of the saplings and they're this big and they have 10, 12 rings already. They're just, they're getting stunted. They need light. So she asked, a lady from church asked if I would talk to Pearl and I did. And I came and talked to Pearl. She goes, well, I just don't want it to look like so-and-so and so-and-so. I don't want it to look like a wreck. And I explained to her about horse logging and selective cutting and worse first thinning. And we talked about emerald ash borer. Thank you very much, World Trade. I guess the emerald ash borer came in in wood packing fibers on a cargo ship. And we have our ash trees in this continent have no immunity to it. It's a East Asian bug. So I said, well, if you wanted to open up your wood some, we should start with the ash. So we're cutting predominantly white ash and there's some black ash in here. I don't see one right now. But anyways, uh, there's white ash and some black ash and we're cutting predominantly the ash. And if we get done with the 80 acres on the ash before the ash borer gets here, because it's, it's coming, it's not an if, it's a when. Um, then we can see if she likes it or if she wants a few of the mature maples or oaks taken out. But right now, just to get some light going, we take, we're taking white ash and black ash and get some light to the ground. We only take an oak or a maple if we have to to get something to the ground. But then the, the grade lumber, um, that goes to town to a local mill and they saw nice boards and in the centers are called cants, but they make nice lumber out of that. The bolts will go to a pallet mill and they'll make hardwood pallets. The bolts are lower grade logs, smaller logs, and maybe a little more crooked or a flaw with them. And then what you'd call the pulp, uh, traditionally for like paper, we don't sell to the paper mill. We use all this hardwood pulp for firewood for ourselves. And then we, right next door, there's an elderly couple that asked for a 12 cords, a semi load. So we're hauling 12 cords to the neighbors of firewood, firewood pulp. And uh, that's what we're doing with the woods. So it's a selective cutting, we're taking the ash because not to be mean, but it's just kind of doomed. Right, right. Yeah, you may as well make good use of it while it's before, still in good shape. Before it's dead. So, so how do the dollars work? Um, you you have a deal with the landowner. I have a deal with the landowner. Or something I have in a deal some with, arrangement. Yes, I have a deal uh -huh. with the landowner, and then some of the local farmers. Um, we talked touched on that a little bit. The milk industry is really hurting right now, so I and a couple dairy farmers work together on this um, every day. N not really employees. We we work together, and everybody gets a share, and uh, we all make a little extra money off the farm. We look out for each other. Then I'm not here alone getting two cords a day out, I'm probably just as profitable as if we come with these guys and get five cords a day out. The difference is, is if I get in a pickle, I have help. 
they're not alone in their woods. I'm not alone in my woods. We will look out for each other. And and, uh, and when spring plowing gets here, your horses are hard. Horses are tough. You know what you got. I mean, they know what G is. If you want to back a corn planter in the shed because the rain's coming, they know what G and haw is, and you can back that thing in. Right. Exactly. Jason's new stallion, Conan, had been on the farm for about five months when we visited last February. Prior to that, Conan had had very little training or exposure to much more than the pasture he'd been living on the past eight years. He went from, he was, he was never under a roof. When he came in the pole barn the first day, he literally sat here and trembled. The first time, you know, when I thought I had him far enough that he could go in a tie stall, the first time I had him in that tie stall, I had two-thirds of that horse in that manger. I, I thought I had a real mess on my hands. Everything was just huge to him. And I'm afraid you'll probably see in the woods today, if he gets real frustrated, you know, his go-to thing for eight years was just to blow up and get loose and be free. So when he gets frustrated or fe feels a little claustrophobic, he still, you know, thinks that that's his go-to option. But he has came a mile. Does he have a mile to go yet? Absolutely. But out of my three Brabant Stallions, he is probably the finest. He's got clean legs, which in our breed is a real important thing, having clean legs. He has a really good mind, a, a really good mind, or we wouldn't be as far as we are now. There's no way, you know, you take an eight-year-old stallion and get this far if he didn't have a good mind. You know, if he was actually a renegade, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do much. But he's got a good mind, and he's coming a long ways. And we keep working him with good horses. Um, he, Holly, my, my good old Holly, she broke him. She trained him. I just went along for the ride. And uh, Holly's due the 1st of May, end of April, and she's got shoes on, so she'll be on the forwarder today. Hannah just weaned her colt, so she wasn't working this fall, so she never got shoes nailed on with drill techs. And Conan doesn't have shoes on with drill techs. Conan's eight and a half years old and never had a foot picked up yet. So when you see his feet, that is completely natural. Unbelievably good feet. But anyways, Hannah and Conan will be on the log arch or ground skidding today in the bush off the ice because the roads are getting packed and glazed here and we get in late February and they're so slippery that I cannot take a horse without drill tech on the roads. So yeah, so they'll stay off the ice today because Conan and Hannah don't have shoes. Holly, Little Red, and Eve will do the forder with one of my hired guys. Uh, I have two Amish guys, well actually I have three Amish guys that work with me in the woods. And they're all small farmers all working off the farm in the daytime so we can try to make extra money. We all try to work Monday, Wednesday, Fridays in the woods. And, uh, and then on Tuesday, Thursday, on Tuesday, Thursdays and Saturdays, we haul manure and catch up the farms. Conan still has a long ways to go about mare manners. We're getting there, but when he came here, he just wanted to be a serial rapist. I mean, everything he saw, he thought was fair game. So we had to uh, discuss that a little bit, proper etiquette. He hasn't got to breed anything yet. Because, you know, he came in the fall, and uh, I don't want to breed anything until springtime. No, I wouldn't own a stallion that I couldn't drive with my mares. I would soon own a gelding that I could drive with my mares. That's just not an option to me. I don't like excuses for people. You know, people making excuses. Figure it out or geld them. You know, no. My, my first stallion I got at 15 years old was an Appaloosa, a well-bred Appaloosa. And I could do anything off that horse. I could shoot rifle. We would short lope six miles over the Wisconsin River back when I lived in southern Wisconsin. We'd short lope six miles over the Wisconsin River. I'd pull my Billy Cook saddle off. We'd swim out to the sandbars. You're 16, 17 years old. Watch the college girls go by on the inner tubes and they'd smile and wave to you. I know it was the horse, but when you're 16, you don't care, you know. But uh, yeah, and then you'd short, I'd short lope him home them six miles, breed a mare, put them away. Maybe that evening breed another mare and still go for another ride. And this is not a slam against the Irish. This is a compliment. This is our little mutt pony draft cross. And he's gotta have Irish in him somewhere because there is no quit in this little guy. And he ain't afraid of nobody. If I turn him out right now, he'd attack that stud horse. He's not afraid of nobody. And he doesn't know he's little. We've never showed him a mirror. So he thinks he's about 1,800 pounds. This is Little Red. Broke him the same spring as Billings, absolutely. And uh, Little Red is one tough little man. 
and uh, I have to make room for all these colts coming along. So actually Ike, who, work, who works for me, he's an Amish fellow, he's 17 years old, he talked his dad into buying Little Red. So when the logging season's over this spring, Little Red's gonna go home to Ike and Dan's house and just be a full-time farm horse and a part-time buggy horse and a part-time garden horse and a part-time maple syrup collecting horse. And, and I imagine before long he'll be hauling kids to schoolhouse you know, whatever they need. He's just an all-purpose horse, about 14 hands and 1,000 pounds with about 250 pounds of attitude, so that makes about 1,250 pounds by my math. He's just a tough little man. And if you, know, if you don't believe it, you just ask him. He's just not afraid of anybody or anything. God made ponies and mosquitoes. Over, little man. You see his new belted tugs? He's got belting tugs like Eve. He came out of his tugs this winter. He, we were skidding 20 inch popple with him. He come right out of leather tugs. Single horse, ground skidding, 20 inch popple. And he'd just sit down and churn like a little steam engine. You wanna go for breakfast, Joe? Hey, I'm Stacy Lynn. Today, we'll be making some spicy chicken wings with homemade blue cheese dressing. Stacy Lynn. Chicken wings are my favorite. They're like a separate food group to me. The skin is always crunchy and the meat is super tender. I want to tell you the cool story about how Buffalo chicken wings began. Supposedly, an Italian restaurant in Buffalo, it was a wife and a husband team, ordered chicken necks and backs and they got a wrong, mistaken delivery that turned into a situation where you turn lemons into lemonade. So, Instead of making their famous spaghetti sauce that night, the wife said, hey, let's make an hors d'oeuvre for the bar. And she made chicken wings. They already had the blue cheese salad dressing for the salad. And so they just used it with their carrots and celery to cool off the mouth after the spicy sauce that she made for the chicken wings. So there you go. Really, I like to keep a party food really, really simple, so I just use salt and pepper. But you can get as complex as you want to get. You can make the sauces different, you can make the seasonings different, but salt and pepper is great to me, and all I need is a good blue cheese, which is going to be right here, and a great hot sauce. When I'm making chicken wings, I like to make the sauce first. I added a stick of butter to my pot, and I've already heated it up. I'm going to use six beautiful garlic cloves. Garlic makes everything better. One of my grandmothers, and it's not the one that cooks a whole lot, she used to always cook with, with garlic and she put so much garlic in everything. I loved it. My mom did not. One thing about garlic is if you chop it just a little bit coarse, it will um, be sweeter. It won't be as bitter. So I'm going to put that right here into my butter. I've already heated. I'm going to put it back and get it a little bit more warm. And I'm going to add an entire cup of Alaga hot sauce. Alaga hot sauce has a very distinct flavor and it is wonderful. Now the other secret ingredient, Alaga cane syrup. Okay, I'm going to add about a quarter of a cup and maybe a little bit more for good measure. A little bit more to that. And as you see, I really don't like exact measurements, but you can tell, you can tell what you're doing. I'm gonna add a pinch of salt. Delicious. And give it a good stir. Really, the butter just has to be melted and all the ingredients really, really stirred well. And then your sauce is done. All right, while I'm letting that simmer for a minute, I'm gonna start the blue cheese dressing. Super, super easy. We make homemade mayonnaise, which I have in both my books because I think is very, very important. You're going to use a half a cup or a cup of that and eat just whatever, however much you're making. Equal parts, that and sour cream. Okay, so I've got the sour cream in the bowl and then I'm putting in the mayonnaise. Okay, and then I'm going to put in a little bit of salt. Okay, that's about a tablespoon and about a teaspoon of pepper. I'm gonna cut a lemon. Squeeze the lemon juice in. Okay. Give my hands a good wipe. 
and then however much blue cheese you want to put in it. I usually put about a half a cup, which is the same amount of uh, mayonnaise and sour cream. And you can look at it and see if you're going to want that much. You can always add more, but you can't take away. So do what you feel like you want to do. My family's a big blue cheese family. Okay, I'm going to stir that up. Once it's all blended, add the buttermilk. And that's how you make your homemade blue cheese dressing. It's easy as that. Okay, it's time for the chicken wings. I like to keep it simple with party foods. So all I do is liberally put salt and pepper on my wings. You can use any kind of spice you want to. You can put paprika, you can do smoked paprika, you can do anything. But to me, I just like the salt and pepper because I want it all of my flavor in the sauce. I want to taste that, that crunchy outside and that tender inside. So what I'm going to do now is drop a couple of these into my fryer into the pan it goes. I'm going to put probably about 12 in at the time and I'm going to let it go for about eight to ten minutes and then we'll have some chicken wings. And here they go. Listen to the sizzle. Go very slowly. They're wet and they will pop. The oil will just fly out of that pan. I have it set on 350 degrees. If you're cooking in a Dutch oven, just put a temperature gauge in there and make sure it registers 350. It's gonna drop a little bit, but if you're doing it in cast iron, it may not. And you might have a lot of luck doing it in a cast iron Dutch oven. Okay. It's been exactly eight minutes. Gonna lift up the lid slowly and carefully. Lift up my chicken wings and dump them right onto the wire cooling rack. Got the chicken wings, I'm gonna let them cool for a second. I'm gonna stir my sauce, my beautiful, beautiful sauce. And I just can't wait for you to see this. Okay, so I'm just gonna get the bowl and swirl it around without the chicken wings in it so that everywhere that I put a chicken wing, it's going to be awesome. It's gonna get all of the hot sauce goodness. Okay, here we go. I'll be making the rest of them in just a minute, but I don't wanna wait. I'm not the type of person that can wait for my food, but if you can, you can put this wire rack in the oven, in a 200 degree oven with the chicken wings on it, and it'll keep it nice and warm until all the rest of the chicken wings are done. Okay, I've got all the sauce on here. My goodness gracious, that looks so good. I'm gonna plate a few on here. And I'm not one that just eats one or two either. So if you're on a high protein diet, you know you can eat all the protein you want. It's a free pass. Okay, and then I'm just gonna put a little bit of this awesome blue cheese right over to the side. And I don't like just a little bit of blue cheese when I'm eating party, spicy chicken wings. It's gotta be the real deal. Now, if you want great chicken wings, you have got to try this recipe. Those are my spicy chicken wings with homemade blue cheese dressing. I'm Stacy Lynn. See you next time. Stacy Lynn. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information, or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.